stipulated we are the Culture Gap Fest, which means we're mostly known for our gross ignorance when it comes to politics. Second, we're Americans, which means we feel mostly a gross and total indifference to the domestic politics of far-flung and exotic places like Canada. Uh, my first note here was, I'm not nervous. Do you know what that portends? Shitstorm. And we got there so quickly. Um, <laughs> I, I knew it in my bones. I'm so proud of myself. Someone just told me that you can't get Slate Plus in Canada. Is that correct? <laughs> not, you can get Slate Plus. <laughs> Fake in news. OK, all right. All right, well. Why are you spreading lies about <laughs> Slate? <laughs> I guess that bit's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> Next. Uh, I told you, shitstorm. All right. Uh, so I just want a couple things very quickly before we start. This is you're in the sausage factory now. We might back up, reverse, redo something. Also, there's a very extra special sausage factory bit that's going to be thrown off of the gearworks of the machinery, which is uh, we're actually going to do four segments and no plus in honor of the fact that you can't get plus in Canada. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say that there's, a, uh, that there's a hangover and then there's a Dundas hangover. Is it otherwise pronounced Dundas? Dundas, yeah. Uh, and then there's a, I went out on Dundas with Jen Ag hangover. And that's the one that I have. <laughs> Tonight, uh, greetings, polite, bilingual, multicultural, tolerant, nanny, statist friends. <laughs> we are your new American overlords. Uh, I, I, I typically open with a bunch of nonsense only to actually audibly hear Julia Turner's eyes begin to roll around in the, <laughs> in the socket. But I'm going to have been told to be really quick tonight, so I just want to relay one story that I think conveyed to me very economically what it is to be in Toronto, which is I'm in a cab coming over here and we're approaching a yellow light and you will never believe what the driver did. <laughs> the fucker stopped. <laughs> he fucking stopped. But what was really amazing was he actually went about midway into the crosswalk and in Manhattan, this is an occasion to surround the car and start a drum circle on the hood. <laughs> and you're lucky if you walk away without the car flipped and burning and on the nightly news. Uh, and here tonight, one guy smirked, <laughs> which is otherwise known as a Canadian bloodletting. <laughs> All right, are we ready? You guys ready? Very ready. Let's do a show. All right, let's do this. All right, shitstorm. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest live from Toronto edition. Uh, brilliant, make a lot of noise, that's great. Um, uh, it's Wednesday, September 20th, 2017. On today's show, Justin Trudeau is... <laughs> <laughs> Justin Trudeau is arguably the leader of the free world, and as such, he is bearer of uh, the virtues of democracy and the Enlightenment. But far more critically, he's clickbait. What is it about the hunky boy king that generates memes? <laughs> and then Joni Mitchell is uh, a great, if not the greatest, singer-songwriter of both or any conceivable gender. But what is it about her that confounds critics? We ask a great critic we are lucky to have on hand, Slate's own Carl Wilson whose essay on Joni Mitchell appears in the current issue of Book Forum. And, uh, uh, and not finally, we have four topics, so the third one would not be the last one, according to mathematics. Uh, and then, Mudbound premiered at Sundance and was screened at this week's Toronto Film Festival. It is a violent, poignant, intense period epic about two families, one black, one white. We discuss this remarkable film with its director, Dee Reese. And finally, restaurant tricks and memoirist Jen Ag is a Toronto food star, reputationally a bitch, and a very, very good friend of mine. We are extremely excited to talk to her about food and feminism and whatever other topics cross her mind. Joining me today is Slate's editor, Julia Turner. My microphone is sinking slowly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's good because I get to talk and gaze at my navel at the same time. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can uh, hold it. It's fine. Hi, hi Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Julia. Bullshit storm. And of course, uh, uh, Slate's film critic, Dana Stevens. Hey, Dana. Hello, Steven. All right. Should we, should we, you know what? Baby. There we go. I think I got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's dig right in. All right. Stipulated, we are the Culture Gab Fest, which means we're mostly known for our gross ignorance when it comes to politics. Second, we're Americans, which means we feel mostly a gross and total indifference to the domestic politics of far-flung and exotic places like Canada. Um, to wit, when we were going over whether we would do this uh, segment, we, we said Justin Trudeau, is he, is he president or prime minister? Anyway, we don't care. Um, <laughs> Here is what we do know about him. He is a dreamy six foot two pile of cookie dough topped by enviably wavy hair, part Prince Hal, part audience favorite on The Bachelorette. And he has taken the internet by storm, generating very funny memes of the Ryan Gosling, hey girl variety. Uh, but it turns out he's been a meme phenomenon sort of from the beginning. We'll get to that in a second. But why don't we look, why don't we scroll through some of the more well-known Justin Trudeau memes. <laughs> this this one's oh yeah video. this one's an action shot I think that's that the kayaking one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, he is coming out <laughs> to describe this for our listeners at home, we see a a big Bobby lake, the the and out of the distance, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rose Justin Trudeau. It's up a little high. Rapidly approaching. <laughs> this is the highest red and white. Yeah, how long have you been here? Uh, about five years. <laughs> and he chats up some people on the dock because he's their prime minister. Not too bad. Any day I can get out on the water. Very nice. All this work, you know. Thank you for coming to look at our situation here. We appreciate that. You were nice enough to take a picture with me and my family. I'm, I'm the president of uh, my own casino. Oh, excellent, yeah. Uh, about, about six or seven months ago. Yeah, I was in town for uh, the uh, liberal uh, Ontario. <laughs> All right, so um, I, here by stipulated as well, I don't have some watertight framework uh, by which to uh, lead us through this segment. But uh, Julia, I will turn to you and say, what is it about Justin Trudeau, A, that generates the memes, but how is that integrated into a leadership style that's taking on you know, broader and deeper symbolic power in a Trumpian world? Well, I have a great answer to that, but before I give it, <laughs> uh, I, I actually was curious to get a sense from the room of the degree to which Justin Trudeau is a meme prime minister here as well. Like, does the Canadian internet traffic in Justin Trudeau means, please, Clap if you believe, yes, the Canadian internet is full of Justin Trudeau memes. <laughs> All right, now clap if the answer is no, we take him very seriously as the leader of our country. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and then clap if the answer is combo bonus, get you a man who can do both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was... That was you guys are very soberly and moderately split among all of those reasonable positions. That's and now, what I might have now expected. Now come to sensible consensus among. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, I, the thing that struck me in thinking about this is like there is not really another world leader who is an internet meme in, on the order of Ryan Gosling, and obviously part of it is that he's like comically attractive, um, but it has engendered a set of conversations around. Uh, the prime minister in the august internal chat channels of Slate that is goofy and uh, well, I will read you a little bit. I was trying to trying to ask my colleagues what are the conversations we have about Justin Trudeau um, in our internal news chats. Uh, we've had several convos here that end with either me or another employee saying that we eagerly await the Justin Trudeau sex scandal, or mm -hmm. we compare him to Macron. Oh yes, we had such a good conversation about him and Macron's relative hotness. <laughs> I feel like the Trudeau stuff was, as with most, thing, most things, the most fun before Trump. 
That was when it could be enjoyed most purely, when he named a gender equitable cabinet and when he popped out of a cave. <laughs> Uh, and then there is one lone holdout who says, basically, I think he's a cynical narcissist who gets woke praise for progressive layups <laughs> and, and for deliberately being shirtless all the time. <laughs> I, th I think you found the room, as they say. <laughs> uh, the person who holds that belief will be very gratified by that hearty applause. Um, but, you know, we talk so much in the United States about the social media president that we have. We have this... Twitter leader monster, sorry about that, um, who is, you know, uh, been corrupting our entire country and endangering the safety of the world through the kind of corrosive conversation that's happening on Twitter. But in a way, you guys have a social media leader too. And uh, that, I, I wonder if that isn't also uh, troubling in a less toxic way. What do you guys make of it? Yeah, you know, looking over all these memes and thinking about, I mean, obviously what we're limited to here is as Americans who know very little about the way the country is being run, we're talking about his symbolic power on the internet, right? And, uh, and I kept thinking about something, I think many people have said this, but I know one of my professors in college had this idea that the president in the US is, is like the country's husband, <laughs> you know? <laughs> They've always been men, so we haven't yet known what it is to have the country's wife, but that, you know, that there's this kind of, erotic domestic relationship that the populace has as a whole with this kind of symbolic figure of, of the president. Um, and if that's true for us right now in the US, I and mean, this has been said by a lot of people too, we, we're kind of in an abusive relationship, right? Like we have this monster in the house who's completely unpredictable and quixotic and sort of potentially violent and frightening. And, uh, and you guys, on the other hand, seem like the, the symbolic power of the of the figure in the office of prime minister is somehow balanced in between the bay right the woke bay kind of figure that's being invoked in those memes and well the the biggest applause that we got in the room just now was the idea that he's kind of a smoke and mirrors you know mm -hmm. that there's like a, there's an emptiness right. behind that facade uh, and I don't I don't know quite well, where else to go with that but yeah and, it, it has to do with not quite knowing if the man in the house is the man you think he is well I think it also has to do with an ambivalence about how and on, on what terms we lend authority and legitimacy to public figures, especially leaders, especially men, right? There's a crisis of masculinity. We used to have, uh, you know, for hundreds of years, a certain kind of, you know, uh, voice of public authority that was the combination of the president and an anchor man, you know, kind of white, Protestant derived, European descended male with an oaky, vo authoritative voice. And at moments of public emergency or great public import, that was comforting in some way. And that's more of a sort of a father relationship. And when you look at the when you look at the evolution of media, you have FDR as a radio president. There was something about that patrician voice during a depression that was quite comforting. You have Reagan as a maestro of television um, in a way that no president has been before him, uh, and the theater of television. And at moments when public Grief, for example, in the aftermath of the Challenger uh, uh, fiasco, when public grief needed to be expressed, Reagan was actually pretty good at it. I mean, I disapprove of virtually everything else about him, but he, as a performer of public legitimacy in a time of confusion, he was quite good. What I wonder is, woke Bay Justin Trudeau speaks somehow to a desire for masculine normativity absent masculine authority or gravitas? And how is that gonna respond when it's tested? And interestingly, a lot of its power derives from the you know, antipodal contrast to Trump. Uh, and yet, he, does he have the authority to really counterweight the US that's spinning off its axis? I mean, it seems like that's probably a better question for the people in this room than for us. But, uh, but you know, I, 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 I mean, but I mean it really in terms of pu public symbolism, the culture of it rather than the I don't politics know, I guess of I would it. argue the, the opposite, that sort of both Trump and Trudeau are finding different ways to create that relationship with their audiences, and it's less through the broad, you know, kind of the single solitary authoritary broadcast and more through these very loose, informal seeming touch points, like they're just kayaking up to you all over the internet all the time, mm -hmm. like wanting to reach out to you individually, both of them, honestly. I mean, they're kind of more alike than you might think in, in the way that they're omnipresent and, and like to seem off the cuff. 
and the kind of performed off the cuffness that we now require, honestly, of all public figures. I mean, we expect it from celebrities. We want them to like show us the pancakes they're making for their kids in the kitchen on their Instagrams. Um, we now also want it from our politicians. And I, I actually think for, for both men, the question of how you square the off the cuffness mm -hmm. with the authority uh, holds. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and in a way, the reality TV origin sort of holds more for Trudeau than I had realized. It wasn't until I started researching him to talk about him on this show that I, I learned about this boxing match, which I guess everybody in Canada is more than familiar with. Uh, remind me of the guy he was boxing? Patrick Brazeau, right. And so the, the idea that his political career, I didn't begin there, but that it, it sort of took off in a, in a very public way in a literal beatdown of another politician is very Trumpian in his way. And it seemed like he plotted and lied and wait, like lay and wait for, yeah. yeah. It's, it, he, no, the descriptions of the boxing match to someone who really wasn't that familiar with the details are astonishing. I mean, the, the seriousness with which like Trudeau was able to take the opening flurry of haymakers <laughs> and yet he found his legs and then his jab and he was able to slowly work, you know, his opponents. His endurance it, and hard work it, propelled him through, Steve. <laughs> right, and the idea, the kind of unproblematized idea in interviews that he, he gave about it that that was proof of his mettle mm -hmm. as a politician, right? It showed right. that he was a hard worker and that he was dedicated. And this raises a place I'd like us to go before we exit the segment, which is, you know, I mean, I was reading about the boxing match, I kept thinking, and I thought my country was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> right? And there is a way in which Canada and the United States, if you look on the map, were right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, it, it, I'm sure I, the library is really glad they flew us up here to tell them that. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but there is this, there is a, let, let's, let's stipulate finally my last stipulation for the night, I promise, is that there's, that there's, a, there's, there's, there's a social psychology that goes on between the two countries that involves a yin and a yang, a kind of distribution of, of, of social psychological functions in a way. And when we have a nightmare president like Trump, there's a kind of directional shift in, and, and Americans, speaking for myself at least, look to Canada longingly as the country of sensible shoes, you know, pragmatism, consensus politics, a degree of tolerance that you know, may have miles to go, but compared to the United States is really uh, remarkable. Um, and uh, when we have Obama, I think my sense is that it flips in a way and Canada feels like maybe, how does Canada feel? Uh, do you look longingly at us when we have Barack Obama? <laughs> You're fine. You'll be okay. Right. All right. So this is all about my own pathetic inner life and not about... Yes, you're nodding rather vigorously, ma'am. <laughs> uh, the point is, uh, Dana, just throw me any kind of a fucking lifeline right now. What, what? Well, here's a question I have. So basically... A bunch of people, when Trump began to seem like he was gaining traction in the election and we began to contemplate that he might actually win, uh, although... I only, honestly rarely contemplated that until election day. Uh, yeah, but anyways, it seemed clear that something was working. There were a few pieces, I think Slate ran one, of like, well, so how would folks on the left feel um, if like a kind of the canny social media star from the left? Like, what if Kanye ran for president? Like, what if someone else who was like a good image maker, but who espoused liberal values instead of conservative ones? How would we feel about that? Basically, that experiment is already being conducted in mm -hmm. Canada because he employs all these flim flam tactics, and yet the things that he chooses to say with the platform that he's uh, acquired for himself are about tolerance and inclusion and you know, maybe let's not talk about the pipelines, but um, he, like the the general baseline things he's using his flim flammery to advance, at least from where we sit, look pretty great. And that's that's the con that that's the future that seems uh, interesting to contemplate from where we sit. Is you know how if this is the future of what politicking is, how will we feel about it when it's applied? towards evil and good like what you know is mm -hmm. there is there a way to deploy it well and i think probably it's a little too soon to say what he'll actually be able to achieve but uh it's that, that's the question i have well and then and this is a lot to get into but another specter that his ascension raises is that of dynastic power right i mean one of the big sort of marks against hillary like, among people that hated her was that there was something dynastic about the clintons and that she was just coming up because of her husband. Obviously, Justin Trudeau is, you know, 
crowned by his, his father's prime ministership before him. So, so to balance that as well with what seems to be this, uh, this woke bay coming out with his boxing gloves on, you know, I mean, those two things marry together in a way that's maybe a little bit disturbing as well, the inherited power and the retail politician skill. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm still curious to know, and we won't solve it in this segment, which is now coming to a close, is just what, when, you know, when the, some combination of the late night comedians and the general psyche of the public projects a set of images or expectations on a leader, they're empowering him to do X or disempowering and, and limiting him from doing X. And I'm just still very curious to know, and maybe our Canadian listeners or otherwise politically uh, literate ones can come to facebook.com slash culturefest and tell us, is he being limited or empowered and to do what or not do what? I'd be very curious to hear it. All right, moving on. Is that that was like a little titter of relief? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll throw you a bone. Uh, let me welcome to the stage the wonderful Carl Wilson. Hi. Hi, guys. Hey, man. Welcome back. Thank you. You're a supreme EFOP, <laughs> a supreme, <laughs> extreme friend of the program. I uh, like the FOP is in that engram. That's my favorite part of it. <laughs> of the show? <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> just, just, you know, the gathering of FOPs that we are. <laughs> yeah, the weekly gathering of FOPs. All right, in 1971, says critic Carl Wilson, Joni Mitchell kicked off one of those runs, a series of albums in the record guides with five stars attached to each one of the titles, one after the other over a period of whatever, whatever it was, seven or 10 years, starting in the late 60s with Clouds, then Late as the Canyons, then of course Blue, one of the great, you know, truly maybe the greatest record ever made. Court and Spark, For the Roses, on and on, through a more complex uh, kind of trouble in her own sound with uh, Hissing of the Summer Lawns and Hajira. These albums are on par, obviously, with Blood on the Tracks or Harvest or really any piece of popular art ever made, arguably, many of them are. Uh, and yet her reputation feels uh, unsettled. Uh, is this because she's a woman, a Canadian, considered something of an infamous prank, or almost too much of a genius for her own good to discuss? I welcome Carl Wilson once more. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Uh, Carl, that's a, a, a great essay you wrote. But before we dig in, uh, why don't you pick a Joni track? Yeah, I thought I would start. Um, you know, Joni's not a Toronto artist, but very briefly she was. and in the way of all things Canadian, um, that allows us to claim her forever. Um, so I thought I would choose um, a song that she wrote in the mid-60s in the time that she was around here, um, an early song called Urge for Going. Which may or may not play. Mm -hmm. Shitstorm. <laughs> This is dying, all that lives is getting old. <laughs> that was part of it. <laughs> um, we'll add it in we post. Continue? Yeah, we'll add it in post, right? You got it. Um, I uh, guess, I mean, there are a couple of things about that, although, although in the room we didn't quite get its full measure. But I, there are a couple <laughs> of things. Um, one is thematically, I mean, I don't want to um, spend much of this time rebutting or complicating your Justin Trudeau segment, but um, I think one of the things to think about in terms of where Canadian artists begin from and where Canadian politics begin from, I would differ with the room in a lot of ways that there isn't a reaction, attraction, repulsion relationship with America um, that's always going on. And I think Toronto is particularly prey to that um, and our self-image is created kind of in contrast to that. My Trudeau footnote would be that we might have been outgrowing that, and Trudeau may be a kind of gossamer, um, out-of-date recollection to this kind of Canadian superiority complex. Mm. But anyway, um, so, so, that, so what you have with Urge for Going, a couple of things. Um, the early style that she had, which was this, you know, the, the poetess, kind of voice and the very high soprano, very delicate styling that, that marked her early years. Um, and then you also have thematically this thread that runs out throughout her career, um, but certainly is very marked in those early songs of the desire to flee and to run. 
um, which she very quickly did from Toronto after a couple of halcyon years playing um, the Yorkville clubs, which are just a couple of blocks west from us and now a Tony shopping district, but at this time was kind of Canada's Greenwich Village. Um, and then she married and moved to Detroit with her singer husband and eventually left him and moved to New York to do that and left and moved to California and this trajectory happens remarkably quickly. So, this, so I've, my essay was based around this new biography of Joni um, called Reckless Daughter by David Yaffe, um, which I have mixed feelings about. One thing that you feel incredibly strongly reading it is um, the historical situation that she was in and the way that her rapid progress from rural Saskatchewan, from a very, very sort of remote post-war um, kind of nothing culturally, to savvily getting to the late 60s where she was advancing the art of songwriting in ways that, that certainly no women of the decade were doing in quite the same way, and none of the men really either, um, is this trajectory that's really quite remarkable to contemplate. And, and you know, we're maybe now at the historical remove um, to, to think about it a little more clearly. Mm -hmm. and, and just to talk for a second about what's so utterly distinctive about what she does. Uh, there's something about the tuning of the guitar, the chord progressions that she then you know, iterates out off of those tunings, and, and therefore, like the architecture of the song is unusual. It's not something you hear any place else, on top of which the melodies aren't only just sort of bewitching, they're also uh, uh, sophisticated and complex in ways that they couldn't otherwise be if the architecture beneath them weren't so, in its own weird way, recondite, but not at all unpleasant. I mean, Im immediately catchy tunes, but built out of something completely newfangled. Yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult to deconstruct all the things that happened in that rapid period of growth, but one of the things, I think, is that um, she was a rock and roll teenager from a conservative family who basically had nothing but a few classical albums and some show tunes mm. in the house, all of which she really liked and carried with her, came into the folk scene kind of a bit as a joke, like it was a, it was a hobby while she was going to art school, um, and everything changed because she got pregnant and fled the West, basically, so her parents wouldn't know that she was pregnant, um, gave up the child and began writing songs. And this is, and the biography is interesting on this, it's disputable how this works, but one of the things is that she had childhood polio, um, as did Neil Young, by the way, um, and she found a lot of guitar positions difficult um, in terms of physical strength. Another part of it is that she was, by her own admission at every phase in her life, a terrible student and didn't really have the patience or desire to be taught, particularly by these guys in the folk scene, how to play guitar. So she kind of rapidly found ways to adapt it to sounds that she wanted. And then I think out of that, just instinctively seeking sounds that appealed to her, she found these unconventional chord structures that reach back to jazz and reach back to classical and, and appeal to a sense of melody that she has that is kind of underrated perhaps in the Bob Dylan era. And trying to bring all of those things together in this really instinctive and not particularly concerned about what anybody else thinks ways. And she says that when she started writing songs, you know, she started off as a bit of a imitator of Joan Baez style folk music. And as soon as she was writing her own words, she started to feel like her voice started to change. And within a few years, it had changed utterly and was, and was like a, unlike anybody else's. You know who I thought of when you're talking about her building her style, her music songwriting style out of the, the lack of training that she had was, a, was one of Julia's favorites, Liz Fair, who also has very strange chord structures and an odd way of constructing a song that she often says came about just simply because she hadn't come up boy style, you know, learning rhythm and blues and then piling these things on top of it that she, that she kind of came at it sideways and had to invent her own Yeah, style. I mean, the amount to which she wasn't a musician as a teenager is really, there aren't that many boys in the field that you can compare it to. Like she just didn't do it at all. Mm. And then suddenly she was, That's and suddenly she was playing better than anybody. And there's this remarkable thing, which I realized at some point in the biography, where suddenly she's playing piano in the like late 60s, early 70s. And you're like, wait, the last I knew of her touching a piano was when she quit piano lessons angrily when she was eight because her teacher hit her with a ruler. And there's never a mention of her ever touching a piano again. And suddenly she's playing this very fluid piano. And it's like, where did that come from? And 
every moment of her story feels very like that. I mean, and we could talk about, there are some ways in which that's also this kind of Canadian um, outsiderness that I think that she brings, which is a certain freedom from the entertainment industry, I think mm -hmm. that's unlikely in, in an American context. And I think all of those 60s Canadian and early 70s Canadian singer-songwriters bring a little bit of that distance to the whole project and, and find voices that are a little unusual from, the, from that. You talk a little bit in your piece about this, but I'd be curious to hear you elaborate on the unsettled legacy. I mean, it, I, it, I hadn't quite thought about how much I hadn't thought about Joni Mitchell till I read your piece, and that makes sense. Like, she's, how come she didn't get nominated for a Nobel? How come she, I mean, she's obviously, no one would ever say she's mediocre or bad. She's like a, I mean, to me, it's, she's like so frighteningly talented. I, I honestly find her somewhat terrifying. I feel like she's sitting there kind of like, with her hand on like the third rail of life's ineluctable melancholy and just like daring you to grab it and just like hang hey, come with me to the dark place like and then meanwhile she sings so like an angel that like I feel ashamed to sing along because it's like why like why would anyone try to sing I, like, Julia, I have to interrupt here and just say that's the first time in the history of this show that I've ever heard you place your hand on the third rail of life's ineluctable <laughs> I like don't do it. That's why she terrifies me. <laughs> but she, she, she must I, have really fucked with your head, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, her robot body would conduct the electricity <laughs> extra hard. Yeah, nobody touched Julia. <laughs> Step away from Julia. Anyway, she is obviously quite a powerful artist, but um, but it is true that that she she doesn't quite have that. You know, she's been a little bit of a twist in between, and it's hard to tell whether it's because of the gender thing or because she's grown into kind of an ornery old lady, uh, as she predicted. Um, but I'd be curious to hear you assess the dynamics there. Yeah, I mean, as you were saying, she sort of started talking about this before she even turned 30 and started predicting that she was going to be an ornery old lady. And I think that was her already reacting to the reactions that she was getting, and maybe also being somebody a little more uncomfortable with fame than most celebrities. Although, what is Bob Dylan if not an ornery old man? Yeah, but the, but the 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 difference is that we don't begrudge at him, right? Like that's that's the thing that feels all the way along from the sort of sexist condescension and sort of you know wolfized ogling that she got in the music press when she was in her twenties to the blame on her for daring to change stylistically and embrace jazz sounds and new sets of musicians and all the things that she did in the seventies to the like extreme reaction for her daring to be political or a little nasty mouthed about her peers and all of that kind of thing as she got older. All of these things feel like, yes, these are parts of reasons for her reputation, but you can't help feel that they're all gendered, that, that again, we just don't treat any of those other sort of legends of that time the same way that we do her. And even though, no, as you say, nobody denies her greatness, nobody denies her influence, basically the kind of entire tradition of white women singer songwriter, you know, really stems directly from her, and and you can't point anywhere else, and nobody would deny it. But you know, one thing I've noticed with millennial audiences is that they talk constantly about Stevie Nicks, and almost never about Joni Mitchell, and I feel like that is this sense of like that got too complicated. There's not, you know, there's mm -hmm. not a simple icon to deal with, and it's a bit of a cliche to talk about Joni Mitchell because. Little fair girls talked about Joni Mitchell in the '90s, but also like we don't know how to take the full measure of Joni Mitchell, and we feel like we can take the measure of Stevie Nicks, and so it's a very mud muddy legacy in that way. I think you really saw that come out. Remember when she almost died a couple of years ago, right? She had a brain aneurysm or something. Yeah, she was in the hospital, yeah. and uh, and so people thought that that might be you know the last days of Joni Mitchell, and there was this outpouring of of talk and love about her. But there was also, especially because of the crank that she embodies, and we should talk about maybe some of the elements of what make her so hard to deal with in her personal, you know, in her persona. Um, but because of that, maybe, yeah, there was a kind of stepping away from the, the absolute lionization that you would expect of a figure like that if it really was true that she was on her last yeah, legs. I mean, I think there are some people whose reputation is already so, you sense that they're, that, you know, they're already deeded over to posterity, right? So we the living have nothing relevant to say about them. We understand that they've been handed over to the future, and the future will make quite a lot of them. And you don't feel this way 
with all due respect about Stevie Nicks. So it's safe to have a kind of friendly canonization, living canonization of her in a way that's mildly condescending, but you can't mildly condescend to Joni Mitchell. And, and I, there's this sense in which the second that we hear she's gone, which hopefully is many, 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 many years in the future, will suddenly be liberated unto our awe at what she's accomplished. Yeah, absolutely that's true, but it, you know, one thing is that I don't think that's many, many, many years in the future by all signs. She's, her health has been bad for quite a while, um, and that last scare was very severe, and she's apparently recovered to the point that she gets around in a wheelchair now, but that's the point two years later that she's recovered to. Um, so a, a little bit the way that we talked at the end of 2016 about, um, you know, on Slate we did this tribute to Stevie Wonder for the very purpose of like, let's That's do right. this so that he's not dead when we do it. Um, because we'd lost so many people in 2016 and thought about how they didn't hear the appreciation that they got. Um, I feel like that a little bit about Joni and I'm glad this biography, flawed as it is, is out because I feel like it'd be nice if we came around to celebrating that legacy before it was just all in obituaries. Yeah, beautifully said. So um, uh, Blue is one of those records that I just don't think anybody's collection is complete without, uh, you know, regardless of what the focus of your own particular interests or tastes happen to be. Most people have it. If they don't, they should get it. Give us, before, before we close off here, give us a, a record that even Joni Mitchell fans like me might not have or might not know that should be added. I sprung this on you by surprise, so you can... Uh, my answer to this is, is the most contrarian answer possible. Blue. Um, predictably, no. Buy a second copy of Blue. <laughs> yeah, you don't really know Blue. Yeah. Um, so my introduction to Joni Mitchell came in kind of three stages. One was um, singing the circle game in like grade one um, with my teacher playing the guitar. Third rail of melancholy. <laughs> um, secondly was when Court and Spark became a big hit and you just heard it help me in, um, in Canada, but not in the States, raised on robbery all the time in the radio. Um, and then third was that I, when I started taking records out of the public library, um, I think first I took out Court and Spark, and then I thought, oh, what's this one? And it was Mingus, um, which is probably her most demonized of classic period records, if we don't talk about this sort of synthesizer and political rant dominated records, <laughs> records of the mid 80s. Um, and I, you know, coming to it innocent of why people would say that this folk singer shouldn't collaborate with the jazz great of the 20th century. Um, just thought it was amazing. <laughs> um, so I do feel like it definitely takes more time to penetrate. But I think now that um, Hissing of Summer Lawns and Hajira um, are a little more canonized than they were um, in their time, then it's not as much of a stretch for people to get into Mingus um, with all of its touches on Joni's weird race fetishization um, elements, which definitely float through it. But just her as a jazz singer dealing with a bop-centered kind of harmonics, it's, it's really an incredible thing. With, and you have to listen to like 10 minute long songs. And I think people should. Yeah, fantastic, Mingus. <laughs> All right, well, Carl Wilson, thank you so much for coming back on the show. You really, thank you so much. All right, well, our next guest, guest Dee Reese, is the director and co-writer of Mudbound and previously Pariah and HBO biopic of Bessie Smith. Please welcome to the stage. We are so pleased to have her, Dee Reese. Hello. I am slowly going, going blind, but I'll see what I can do here. Um, Mudbound is a period drama. It tells the stories of two families, the McCallan family and the Jackson family, one white, one black, uh, who, re who together re relocate to a farm in the Deep South right around the time of the Second World War. Each family has a son who serves in the war, each of them courageously. Though returning to America, they are offered radically different homecomings. Netflix bought the film for a handsome son at uh, Sundance. It's been screened at this week's Toronto Film Festival. Its cast includes Mary J. Blige, Carrie Mulligan, Garrett Hedlund, Jason Mitchell, uh, and uh, Jason Clark. Uh, before we dig in, why don't we uh, listen to and watch a clip? 
How long have you been back from overseas? Oh, well, just a couple of weeks. Much obliged, Miss Triple Banks. You give yourself a wonderful day. Take care. It's all right. It's just a car. It must have backfired. They say it stops eventually. You just come back. Come all the way back. My nightmare is always the same. I scream. But there's nothing coming now. This place, this law, we don't belong to them. And I think of the farm. I think of mud. And crusted knees and hair. Our family's in trouble. You understand that? Do you? What's the worst thing you ever did? You betray your own blood. You can't even see your own wife is miserable. Silence. Oppression. Fear. It would take an extraordinary man to beat all that. Amen. I think everyone in this room is going to see that film if I had to guess. Has anyone seen it already in the room? No, at the festival, maybe? <laughs> it's still showing a few more times, right? Yeah, yeah, I think they added a screening, and it's going to screen um, tomorrow, and then there's a screening on Friday. So, yeah, I don't have the theater names, but... Yeah. And when is it opening? So it opens November 17th, and it'll be in Netflix, and it'll be a limited um, theatrical release also. So you have some options. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I managed in the space of my short introduction two misrepresentations. The first is the Jackson family is already down in Mississippi. They don't really mm -hmm. locate there. But the, but the second one, which is sort of intentional, is this is a movie in the best possible way without a MacGuffin. It's really not built around uh, uh, you know, any one relationship or pairing. It's really not exclusively about any one point of view or, or plot line. It, it really is about... Uh, being a brother, being a soldier, being a mother, being an evil patriarch, being an American, being dispossessed, uh, having possession of land or wanting possession of land. Uh, it's just a remarkable achievement because it is so many things in the span of whatever it is, two plus hours. Was that daunting? I should say it's based on source material and novel. Uh, you went into this having read the novel and knowing you were making a large film with a lot of elements. I'm very curious to talk to you just as a film director mm -hmm. about what it's like to begin with a novel which is sprawling and large, it has epic scope, and to turn that into something that people can experience in 120 minutes, that just strikes me as remarkable. Wow, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the thing that attracted me to it was the multiple points of view, and the thing that I responded to in Hillary's writing was the internal monologue, so more than the dialogue, I was interested in like this kind of inner monologues each character would have in these inner churns. And then I even wrote some original monologue for Hap and Florence to kind of like give those characters more depth. But for me, like I lead, like I get attracted to relationships and characters. And so that's what I kind of go in with first. And I love that, you know, you could think this is a story about two brothers. And then we figure out, no, it's not about two brothers. And you think, okay, this could be a story about a marriage falling apart. And it's like, it's not just that. And then you think, oh, this is a story about sharecroppers and landowners. And like, no, it's not that. And then you think, oh, wait, it's about these two soldiers. So I think the big risk in this kind of material is that it can very easily become nobody's story. Mm -hmm. And so but like yeah. that was, you know, a, a big, you know, edit, like the editing room. And we wanted this to be everybody's story. And I wanted to kind of capture this dark symbiosis, or you could even say like a parasitic relationship between these two families who are kind of locked in this system. And so with each kind of, you know, they're kind of like this dark mirror, mirror of each other in that, you know, the sons are linked by trauma. The mothers are linked by economic kind of disempowerment where their husbands are kind of making the financial decisions but the wives are going around them and then the um the the, the two men the two you know pay, you know 
husbands are united by this sense of disinheritance um, in very different ways. Like Henry from the landowning family feels that his grand that his father sold the land he was supposed to have from under him, so that's why he latches onto this piece. And then Hap, um, the head of the household for the sharecropping family, and they used to be share tenants, not share croppers, but he breaks his leg and I won't give it away, but so he's kind of, they've slid back back in the debt, and so he's disinherited because his ancestors have worked this land for generations, and his blood, his sweat, like his people's bones are literally in this land, but he can never own it. And, you know, I wrote this meditation about um, deed versus deeds to kind of do the play on words to show how, like, actions, you know, can be kind of um, made less than by a system, by this legal deed that literally tells this guy that he mm. can never take title to it. So I just That's like all the struggle, and I also wanted to show like poor whites. So you have like the Atwood family that are in the novel, and it's important to show, you know, the McCallans' discomfort with them. So we see the middle class whites who are not comfortable with the poor whites, and how they're all in the muck together, and the mud just becomes like a metaphor for race, for the system we're all stuck in. And I want to emphasize that at the center of all of it is you, right? Like uh, to the extent mm -hmm. that there's coherence mm -hmm. and narrative tension, uh, uh, throughout, that really is the, the hand of a, of a director and a, and a competent one, which is a remarkable achievement. But uh, another question, just as someone who's amazed that someone can direct a movie, is you, you have it on the page, you know, really, remar that remarkably, that you could at the end of such a chaotic and contingent process end up with something that's aesthetically unified and internally unified, but, but among the miraculous things that you must have to do as a director. You've got it on the page, and let's see you even have it perfectly on the page. You are then handing it over to a team of artists who are autonomous artists in their own right. This is an extraordinary ensemble piece. Talk a little bit about your actors and the performances, and we have to talk about Mary J. Blige. Yeah, no, totally. So it's like seven actors, and like, first of all, they're like generous because it's like no one's necessarily like the lead, but it was just important to get people that could really like stand and look at each other and like hold ground. And also, like, you know, casting is like the biggest part of directing, but I think sometimes it gets undone if you don't have producers that back you up. And, you know, in making films, there's such a pressure to have, you know, you know, certain names that justify a budget. And so, you know, with this film, like we had big names, but they, but the producers also really just let me have it. And like, for example, like with Rob Morgan as Hap, I was like, you don't know Rob Morgan, you've never heard of him in your life, but he's gonna be Hap and he's gonna be he's great. He's so good. And, you know, and so like things like that, like, like impacted. And so, you know, I was really interested in having faces that felt like they were from the period. So I cast a lot with look also. So for um, Mary J. Blige, like she has this like tear shaped scar. And so I wanted to film this perpetual tear and she's beautiful. And like I needed someone for Florence who could have this vulnerability and like this deeply empathic kind of sense of the world, but then also be able to put up a wall and have this re reserve. And Mary's character absolutely like, like Mary nails it. Like she really like goes inside and you know, she stripped away the makeup, no wig, no anything. And Florence doesn't says everything she thinks, but you see all the time like this life in her eyes. And like she was so far into character, like even like some of her co-stars didn't know it was her. Like there's this young kid who's playing like her son who is sitting like from here to there to her. And so we're doing scenes and like when I'm on set, I call actors generally by the character's name. And I slipped and said Mary. And he's like, wait a minute, you're you're Mary J. Blige? Wait, you're Mary J. Blige. Wait, da, 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 da. And so I was like, okay, Gilbert kid, like now we gotta like go. But it's kind of funny because he was like holding forth before saying, oh yes, I've done this, and next I'm doing that, and da da da. So it kind of like quietened a little bit down after that. But um, <laughs> and he was like silent for like the rest of the day. <laughs> but um, but um, yeah. And then um, like Jason Clark plays Henry, and I was looking for a swaggering, salt of the earth kind of guy, and you know. Jason is like such a fun collaborator like we first met like over Skype and like I'm in a parking lot somewhere in like a hoodie and like explaining like whiteness as currency and that was my really a approach for the McCallum family so they all have it it's about how they spend it differently and you know like I was saying how Pappy kind of flaunts his currency Henry who uh, Jason plays you know spends it firmly and then Laura kind of barters with hers and then Jamie the son kind of tries to burn his but Jason really took that on, and in every scene, he's got his hand in his pocket, kind of jingling this kind of metaphorical cu currency, and it's great. So I just love actors that can take that kind of stuff on. Um, Carrie Mulligan, like I needed somebody who, for Laura, who could play two women. So like Laura starts out in Memphis, we meet her at a table. You know, she's like Laura of the mind. You know, she's an intellectual. She's like you know civilized. And by the end of the film, she's a farm wife, and she's chewing calluses off her hands, and she's slumping, and she comes very round and. So she's like Laura of the body. So I needed an actress who could be two people. 
and Carrie Mulligan is that, and again, was willing to throw away vanity, jam dirt under her nails, we put muck on her, and you know, she took a bath in front of jo Jonathan Banks, you know, so it was just like, um, really great. And then Jonathan Banks, I just love Breaking Bad, so he was great as Pappy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, who else? Oh, so Jason Mitchell I've seen in Straight Outta Compton, playing Easy e which is, if you haven't seen Straight Outta Compton, you need to, because you think you know, but you don't know. But it's <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I thought I knew, and like, I had like the tape when I was a kid. But, um, but I, you know, like there's this hospital scene where he's crying and hugging another man, and it's like, oh, like, he's like showing male love, and you know, is comfortable with that, and is vulnerable, and is crying, and just allowing himself to be open. So that's why I cast him. And then Garrett Hedlund plays Jamie, the McCallum son who goes off to war. And for Jamie's character, I imagined it as going from a dreamer to a ghost, so both disconnected states. So I needed someone who could have this kind of haunted feeling, this kind of slightly disconnected vibe. And Garrett brought that. Like Jamie, it, Jamie couldn't just be beautiful. He had to be beautiful and dark and kind of broken. And Garrett is like a very physical actor. And we put him in a hole and dumped water on him and drowned him. And like, you know, we did all kind of stuff to him. And, Jonathan Banks actually slapped him and like so it was good and so I mean he's a very physical he was like beat up by the end so I just love actors that could really like all kind of go hard and not seek comfort so it had to have been a physically arduous shoot too right I mean there's lots of mud there's lots of rain what was it was it something that was kind of a hardship to get through in terms of the, the weeks on the set it was horrible it was bad it was like it was like it was um so we shot out in plantation country in louisiana so though the film is set, the story is set in mississippi we shot in louisiana in this weird way like we scouted mississippi but they didn't like hold on to a lot of those historical places like they like raised them or got rid of them in louisiana in this weird, like weirdly, proudly, like had memorialized it, which maybe is good because they're like, I guess, not forgetting it. And so we shot at this old sugar plantation and we convinced a farmer, you know, to let us like ruin like one of their fields, like just pay for the crop. And so, you know, we had to create our own mud with, with water trucks, but it was so hot, it was the middle of July, so the moment we'd like make mud, the sun would bake it and be like a crust. And so like, you know, by we, you know, we finished one direction, we had to bring back the water trucks, make it mud again, and you know, instead of Greensman, we had Bra Brownsman, whose job was to just like make the mud and try to keep continuity and then <laughs> sweep out like tire tracks, so it was like a pain. And then there's like mosquitoes and it's buggy, and we shot in actual sharecropper cabins. Um, our production designers- Oh, so you didn't make those structures? They were there? Yes, yeah, so they're pre-existing. So that was mm -hmm. the thing, like they like preserved all those things. And so our production designer was David Bamba. And so we convinced the landowner to let us move the sharecropper cabins deeper into the field because where they originally sited was too close to the road and too close, you could see the levee. And so we moved them back into the field so where they weren't meant to be. So then he had to make them safe and that meant transporting in and out. You're driving across land that's not meant to be driven on. So. It, it, and, and we want, you know, the DP was Rachel Morris, and we wanted to have these 360 views, which means that, like, the production needed to be, like, very far away to make to become a dot, which means that if you want to see Stan, you know, it's going to be a minute. So it was just, like, all around arduous, but I think that kind of informed the, the whole spirit of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like a sprawling production and a, and a sprawling theme. That sounds amazing. Yeah, so. that and we actually... shot some, some days in Budapest, too. Sorry? Oh, so we shot some stuff in Budapest, too. For the war stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah for the war stuff, yeah. yeah. Well, that, both of those actually yeah. kind of lead me to my other big point of curiosity about the movie, which has to do with the tra trajectory of your career. So mm -hmm. your first feature film was Pariah, right? Mm -hmm. Pariah, yeah. great Thanks. movie. Thanks. It came out about six years ago. Thanks. And, uh, and Pariah, for those who haven't seen it, is an ultra, ultra low budget, right? Mm -hmm. It's under $500,000 It has like movie. 400 something K, and we never had all the money at the same time. Right? <laughs> we would get it in trips, and we just... <laughs> kept going. Yeah, yeah. Right, and it's very local. It all takes place in Brooklyn. It's basically about one person. It's a, it's a coming of age, coming out story. Mm -hmm. It's very intimate and small. And so I'm just curious. And then your two films after that are Bessie, which is a pretty big historical, mm -hmm. you know, period kind of biopic. And yeah. then suddenly you're doing this multi-generational epic where you've got World War II tanks on set. And so yeah. obviously in terms of scale, you moved up really fast. And I'm just curious as a director, what was that like to go from ultra micro budget indie to suddenly, you know, get us a tank in Budapest and Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to blow shit up, honestly. So it was good. <laughs> so you know it was cool. It was great. And it was, you know, it's it was just to me like budget buys you, you know, budget buys you in this case, budget usually buys you time, but this budget didn't really buy us time. We shot in 30 days. Budget can buy you equipment, budget buys you crew, but budget doesn't buy you better performances. So for me, I just focus on the performances and like the relationships and like like composition and blocking, like all those kind of basic craft things don't change. So, you know, 
the budget is kind of irrelevant in a way, ex except that it gives you able to shoot in Budapest and use real tanks and have explosives. And you know, we shot there because they kept all that old stuff. You know, same here. Like whereas we'd have like two tanks if we tried to do it. You know, in the south, we could have like ten tanks in Budapest for the same price, which is a little scary. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> and also like the uh, special effects guys there were willing to do like you know crazier stuff. Is like you know you you know if you do black smoke, it's not supposed to be you know, but so big, but they go, oh, no, no, no problem, no problem, you know? <laughs> so like, you're like, you're like, you know, talking to a translator and hoping that what you're saying is translating and I'm just making a lot of hand motions and <laughs> it was great. And, um, and we had like, um, they had, and so all the American soldiers are actually Hungarian soldiers, but you know, we just kind of like make it work. And then, um, and then we shot the B-25 scene. It was important that Jamie, like I really wanted the actor to be in like a real plane. And, and, and also like Ronzel, like we shot in like, act we didn't shoot in like the, the accurate tanks, but we shot in tanks where you're inside a dark box, you can't tell, it's not like the exact right kind of tank. But, um, but we, it was important, I mean the thing that struck me was that this little piece of flesh goes in this big metal thing, and it seems inhumane, and like that you're expected to function in that space, not only function, but have situational awareness, and be able to like react quickly, like, because you're in the tank, like you're sweating, it's, the air is damp, like you can't see anything, it's dark. And then like in the B-25 plane, like we shot at this like plane museum in Long Island, and because it was actual B-25, they didn't want us to get blood over anything. So we, we had to like convince the owner, oh, now we're gonna put plastic up and we'll totally wipe off all the blood. And so we're exploding blood packs and like, <laughs> then like a reset means like 45 minutes because then we're like wiping up the blood and not getting like on, on the controls. But even like in the plane, like those planes were meant, you know, the pilots are usually smaller men, you know, and Garrett is like tall and hunky. So he's like jammed in this thing. And it, I think it was just great physically to make the actors uncomfortable and to really experience like how war makes people, you know, not human. Because when you're in this metal thing, like your little tiny piece of flesh and this big hot metal thing, it feels inhuman. You shot this in the summer of 2016, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was it like to make a movie on these themes and on the uh, parasitical relationship and the mud that we're all stuck in, as I think you put it at the beginning, uh, as Trump's campaign began to prosper and he became the nominee and then eventually, I mean, I guess you were done shooting by the time you won, but yeah, yeah. Um, how much did you think about our present political moment in shaping the film and in shooting it? Well, like while we were shooting, like the, the script first came to me in 2015 and it was kind of like, we were, we were all, I was already reeling from all these like police killings and so it was already in the air and so Trump's rise just felt like, oh, like we told you so, this is what we've been saying for the past five years with police killings, like this country, you know, has like this subconscious, you know, it's like, I think it's like a psychosis, like we haven't dealt with and like we all need therapy and like things have not changed. And so as we made the film, it just felt like, yeah, like this is now, like it doesn't feel like a period piece. Like I think like whether it was set in like 1940 or 2040 would be commenting on the moment. And I just felt like, like there was one moment where, I forget which shooting it was, like there's so many shootings, it, but, the, but there was one where a police officer was like acquitted and it was like the morning we were gonna shoot the scene like with a little girl like aiming her stick at the, at the car. And I was so angry and we, we, were, we were supposed to scout a field for the Ronzel like night chase, like we we're shooting like that scene that day. And I was so angry and it was like perfect to shoot those scenes like that day. So that bang, you're dead. That just felt like me, just like my ultimate like, you know, just um, expression because it, as just like a citizen, I don't know, I felt helpless. It felt like, what can we do? Like we keep raising our hand and saying this is happening, but no one's listening. And, and so it just felt like that whole rise and maybe his election pulled the tablecloth off the thing that was already there. And maybe, you know, I don't know, we as Americans will finally just acknowledge what's there. And in this film, like I think you could read it on a deeper conceptual levels, like about inheritance and like you need to acknowledge what you've inherited or you acknowledge what you're passing on or it just continues in perpetuity. So yeah, it was just like, it's like very, it was a good outlet. I'm just glad I was making something you know, during the time, because if I wasn't making something, that, I don't know what I'd be doing. That inheritance theme is so powerful in it, but I think the other way that I am excited for people to encounter it and read it is just as a World War II film. I mean, it's a World War II film that tracks both how dislocating the experience is, but com comparatively the experience of a black and white soldier in a way where it feels like there's a lot of glamorizing films about World War II. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's not a lot. There are a very few films about the black experience in World War II, but I haven't never seen one that plays them side by side yeah. in the way that your film does, and it, it was very powerful. Yeah, like I was hoping to get behind the mythology of the greatest generation, and people like romanticize this period, and like I think this is the period Trump is talking about when he says, make America great again. 
but it's like that premise is flawed, like there was never an again, you know? It's like, when is the again? Like name one decade when it was great for everybody, you know? Like I was, I was like, why will no one ask him when is again? You know, I was like waiting for someone, to, like a journalist, like somebody ask him what again? But nobody ever did, but this film felt like, oh, this is the again, like this is what he wants to get back to. But, um, and, and, and showing that, you know, the vestiges of things that are keeping like this one family kind of locked into place. And I just wanted to just, in like both my grandfathers served in different wars, like my paternal grandfather served in Korea and he was from this town called like Fayetteville, Tennessee. And when he came back, he tried to go to Chicago, you know, as part of that mi migration pattern, didn't work out in Chicago, he ended up in Nashville, Tennessee. And then my mother's dad went to World War II and he was from this town called Ringgold, Louisiana. And so instead of coming back, they ended up going to, to Oakland and my grandmother, who's, you know, who a lot of her kind of like spirit is there, like she was born in Faraday, Louisiana in 1925. And when the war came, it opened up like a lot of job opportunities because they started hiring black people for stuff they wouldn't, they ordinarily wouldn't. So she went to California too. And so it just like, for me, was a chance to kind of like interrogate my own personal history and tell those stories. And neither of my grandfathers got what they were supposed to get, you know, so like, the GI Bill, like all that stuff, it didn't work that way for them. You know, I think my one granddad got a job at the post office and that was like, this is your gift, you know, like 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 this is your your, your big get. And my, my grandfather went to the Korean War, came back to be a janitor. And it was like, oh, be grateful to be a janitor at the electric company, like that's a good job. So I just wanna kind of get behind that mythology and show how with equal effort, with equal, you know, capability, like there's this double standard and like these two families are kind of pitted against that. Yeah. Uh, well, Mudbound is an extraordinary film. Congratulations on its huge uh, success, which is uh, only going to increase as we go forward. But uh, Dee Reese, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was thanks, awesome. thanks for having me. Thanks. All right, well, our, 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 our magical fourth segment. Uh, Gen Ag is a restaurant tricks best known for the Black Hoof here in Toronto, as well as Cocktail Bar, and now Grey Gardens, and the restaurant Agricole in Montreal. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also add she co-creates these restaurants with her husband, the painter Roland Jean. Um, uh, she's now a memoirist, author of I Hear She Is a Real Bitch, She's both a supernaturally gifted creator of restaurants and a feminist warrior in the cause of women's rights in, the work, in a workplace traditionally dominated by men. She's also a friend of mine, Jen. Come on up. Let's talk. Where to begin? Uh, I think that's up to you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In we go. Um, so... Uh, uh, Talk a little bit, I, I didn't, when I first met you, I, I met you in the capacity of a journalist writing about what you had created in Toronto and what it meant to Toronto and the food scene. Why don't we just start the filling in for, you know, filling in the backstory for people who may not know. There's what, people in Toronto who don't know? The, 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 <laughs> we have there, there, there may be people listening to the podcast oh, who don't America. live in Toronto. <laughs> Discuss what it is your restaurants have meant to the city and the food scene. Well, I mean, that's always really awkward and embarrassing for me to do, to discuss like what I think they've meant. But um, I think in 2008, when, when The Hoof opened, it was, you know, there was a recession happening. And it wasn't sort of a conscious choice, but, oh, I'm sorry, I'm leaning. I'm trying to be comfortable. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and The Hoof kind of opened at that perfect time where, you know, fine dining was kind of becoming not a thing really in the same way that people either just couldn't afford to go out or didn't you know, want to spend their money in maybe as gauche a way as what fine dining was back then, which was not very interesting. And, and then the hoof opened and it kind of, you know, it, it really did turn a corner uh, for the restaurant scene in the city. I think it would, I feel comfortable saying that. It's, you know, it was a, it was a big deal. And it was, uh, it was a strange thing to go through as well. Well, what made you turn from that to writing a memoir? What specifically about the experience needed well, memorializing in that particular way. In other words, these restaurants, as I've gotten to know you and them, they represent your biography and your creative contribution to a community. Yeah, I mean, I think um, through a series of events, one of which was having a business partner who doesn't see the world the same way I do, one of which was, you know, um, being told it's like not good for my brand to be as 
much of a firebrand as I am. What, like all sorts of things happened that prompted me probably to be a little more um, radical and vehement uh, publicly than I maybe was being out of a sense of loyalty to the business. And eventually I just kind of threw that out the window and started writing about what I was experiencing, the sexism, like how deeply rooted the misogyny in the business and of course in the world is. Um, I think the restaurant business is kind of a really good metaphor for what happens in general because it is so male dominated. And yeah, and it, it was really empowering to start to see at first what was happening was I got like a lot of pushback um, in all sorts of ways. And, and then, you know, only recently, and I think maybe the book has been a turning point, only recently I'm starting to see where, um, I don't know if any of you guys are on Twitter.com, but um, <laughs> on Twitter.com I uh, air my grievances. And recently this, this thing happened, and I think it's such a, like we're kind of double standards is the theme of the night it feels like, so yes. I'm going to just go hard on that. And recently there was, um, there was this case of a, a male restaurateur who's very revered and respected in Montreal, Dave McMillan, who tweets sort of as radically and vehemently as I do about different things. And um, he tweeted something to the effect, and I'm just paraphrasing, uh, dear Dr. Ross from Toronto, we don't care who you are, go fuck yourself. Something to that effect. And one of our, one of our uh, former lo local restaurant critics quote tweeted, do I, need, I don't need to explain what that is, right? So he quote tweeted um, the tweet, and said like sort of gleefully, who else is Googling, you know, Dr. Ross from Toronto right now? So I sort of, I, of course, because I never forget anything ugly that anyone ever says about me, um, I very quickly like called to mind the time he wrote uh, a piece in our national paper about how inhospitable I was for saying something much less offensive and much less specific. I didn't name the people. I don't even want to, I don't even know why I'm talking about this stupid thing that I don't want to talk about anymore, but it's just such a good example of the, the, the way that I see how this fight goes for me, where, you know, this guy says this sort of thing on Twitter, he gets like many, many like virtual high fives. I say this thing and I get like written about um, in this very derisive way and then for the next five years I can't fucking live it down. Like even when people write what I would call friendly pieces about me that aren't hit pieces and there's a lot of hit pieces. Um, I, I have to, I have to talk about it. It's acknowledged in some way, and it's just kind of fucking crazy. Right. So I mean, well, so hitting on the theme of the night, right? So maybe so, Joni's cranky for a reason, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and let's get to the reason. I mean, the, so you know, Joni Mitchell is held to some standard that Bob Dylan isn't. You know, right. um, Dee Reese is, a, a, if she's nominated for this film, as many people expect she will be, she'll only be the fourth woman in the history, I believe, of the Academy Awards to be nominated for Best Director. Is that the stats on that? I think it is, Jesus. yeah. I mean, she'd be the first uh, black woman. And um, I, I speak specifically to the restaurant businesses. What, what is it about that culture that uh, makes it male-dominated and female-unfriendly? What is it specifically about, about restauranting? It's kind of interesting, and I've spoken about this before, about how ironic it is when, you know, men who, who want you to kind of revere their plates as works of art and talk about their grandmothers are so derisive to art and women. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's such a backwards logic. Like, a lot of, I think it's male-dominated because, you know, for the simple fact that it's kind of, it's, this is not going to sound very feminist, but it's a brutal day in the kitchen. It's very physical. Um, it, that is not to say women can't cut it. Of course, they absolutely can. But that's part of it. I think um, there's not, there's less education in the restaurant business than there is in maybe other industries. So that's kind of an interesting thing. I don't know what that has to do with gendering, but that's definitely a thing. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly front of house is not like that. It's different. So there's like, that's where the parody exists is the front of house. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't fully understand why, and it's definitely changing, but just um, recently, I think I was telling you about this last night, um, World's 50 Best, which is like what, uh, whatever, it's supposed to be an antithesis to um, Michelin Guide, but it's like just as douchey. And they, uh, they did like a, oh wait, this is gonna be on the radio. <laughs> No, nah, it's a podcast. It's, it's a podcast. Yeah. Who's hanging out with I that? guarantee you this would never be on the radio. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect. Um, so I'll just like, you know, tell you what I really think. So they, they do this thing every year where, I'm so sorry, I'm like super tangenting right now. But they do this thing where they, you know, they have the, the 50 best chefs or 50 best restaurants. And then I think last year it was, or maybe the year before when Dominique Crenn was like given this sort of like afterthought 
bone of like best female chef. And I kind of, I went to bat for her and she actually didn't say much at the time. Um, and I didn't do it on her behalf. I did it because, you know, it was like a thing where I could be like, hey, look at this, look at this thing that's happening. And I do enjoy doing that. And, um, and she recently came forward because now there's this competition. Sorry, this is like such a stupid, long, boring story. But again, it's to illustrate uh, how, it, how it is. And there's this competition for a young, like the young chefs competition. And in the world, um, within these 31 divided regions, out of 110 or something judges of this contest for San Pellegrino, which is an Italian company, there are three women. Like, you couldn't even just try, you know? It's like April Bloomfield, me, and somebody else. And I can't, like, it's just crazy. So, I mean, and I think that, you know, they want me to, they don't, they don't want me to talk about that, obviously, but it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. So that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> just like a lot of, yeah. No, I was struck reading the prep for our segments on the music industry, the movie industry, and the restaurant industry today that uh, journalism is not perfect, but man, you guys all have it so tough. It's really hard to be a woman in those three professions, it seems like. Jen, can you tell a couple specific stories? I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, in those same, those same articles, I was reading some of the specific anecdotes about mistreatment of women in the restaurant industry. Are there any that spring to mind? I don't know which one to choose, Dana. There are so many that spring to mind. I mean, the big one in Toronto in our recent history was this West Lodge thing. I don't know if you where it came across it in your in your prep for it, but um, Kate Burnham came forward about these like sort of horrifying um, allegations about physical, sexual hazing, harassment that went on for 13 months at the restaurant, the West Lodge that she worked at. And it was just, what was sort of shocking was not that this was happening. You know, all, all women in the industry probably did kind of a collective eye roll of like, yeah, okay, that's, this is no surprise. Um, but what was shocking was, was that she came forward. Um, I don't think it's easy for people, as we saw with Gomeshi, like it's not easy for women to come forward and talk about this. And, you know, even in this day and age when there's a lot of support, um, it's still, it's crazy to me how, how difficult we make it for women to come forward about this kind of thing. And it's so rampant. I wonder too, or I, I wonder if you could speak to um, the sort of non nine to five, non Dilbert culture of restaurants, which makes it, which feels to me like it could both facilitate some of the problems and make, and potentially discourage women from lodging complaints or seeking redress. Because I could imagine feeling like, okay, here's this, here's this industry. It's not very women friendly. Okay, I got this job in the kitchen, and you know, I can imagine wondering where the lines are and feeling like. Uh, well, it's like loud and it's hot and we're, we're it's it's like warfare practically back yeah. here. Um, so at what point has a line and, and the whole thing's abnormal? We're up all night and we go out drinking afterwards and we we don't live the same lives as other people and we don't have the, and we're kind of the cool kids back in the house and all the squares are out there eating the thing we make. And maybe I'm overly no. Projecting. I think I think you've actually nailed it. And so, like, it. how do you you know? So, like, what I'm going to go like fill out a slip with HR? Like, it, like I think that's a hard mm -hmm. thing to do, even when there is like a brown door that says HR on the front, and there's like a process that you could look up or begin. You know, I, I wonder if you've dealt with this in the restaurants you run, like trying to create a space for people to do that or think about the dynamics of. I mean, actually, honestly, it's true of music and filmmaking as well. There are less. Uh, not that it's like a piece of cake to report stuff like this anywhere, but um, you know, there cool industries. So uh, I think you, you hit on something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, which is how difficult we make it for the kids coming into the industry, maybe not even consciously. Um, you're, you're a young kid, you're 20 years old, you're, you're, it doesn't matter, you're a guy or you're, this is just as bad for men too. It's not, you know, it's not just specifically for women. Um, and you're coming into a kitchen where you're excited to be and you like worship the chef. Um, so when you start getting mixed signals or the chef starts maybe making racist jokes at you or sexist jokes at you or like, you know, hitting you in the face with a, a hollandaise squirt, which I assume, you know, is self-identifying as to how gross that is. Um, and if that, if that starts to happen to you, you're 20 years old, you're working in this sort of dream job, you don't go and complain to your manager. Your manager is the one doing this to you. Mm -hmm. you. You laugh along you find a way to fit yourself into that world 
and it becomes completely normalized. So that's why you know you'll see when when something like this happens at a restaurant, you don't actually like, most most people in the industry think this is fine. They they literally call it camaraderie. Right. And I think that's really where the crux of the problem is is that it's not identified as a problem and I think you know that's the whole thing about uh, and the fun of it and the drinking together just blurs those lines even more. Right. And all forms of ritual hazing are self-perpetuating, right? You Absolutely. do it to someone and then they find it kind of normalized, they hold it up as a kind of battle scar, they're proud yes. of having survived it, and then they pass it on to the next. Yeah, it's so cyclical. It's very cyclical. So I'd be interested to hear what you've done in your establishments to break the cycle. I mean, in addition to not being male. There's a couple a couple of things. First of all, I, you know, I'm careful. Like we we have people working in some of our restaurants that I would say are bro identifying. But like <laughs> but because we're bringing, say, this young broish kid who's worked at, you know, a, a higher end restaurant or whatever um, that's kind of corporate and has picked up these like bad habits. Um, if we put them in our swimming pool, they start to drink our water. And you know, either you get to someone and you kind of change their future, or you don't. Like, but at least you don't kind of let that infect your pool. You don't let them pee in your pool. If I can like really take this pool analogy all the way to the end. Um, I've also had, you know, this was like, I've talked a little about the story. Um, I had a server come to me, and I'm so glad she did. Uh, one of our cooks uh, had like called her over and been like, hey, look at this. And it was like a dick pic, and it was his dick. And I couldn't fucking believe it. I've never screamed at an employee like I screamed at this guy. He was on his way out already, but like we were three days from the end, and I just said, we're done here. Like you... I had no like zero zero tolerance for that kind of thing. Like you're immediately done. It's over. Um, that's the only thing under my sort of autonomous leadership that is, that has really stuck out as because we're very careful about who we hire. Like if you're not fitting in, for lack of a better word, and by fitting in, like you're an it getter, you understand like the way this restaurant is. It's a special place. We want to nurture it. We don't want to screw it up. We don't hire you. Yeah, um, I think what's it's all top down. Sorry, it's top down, and that's the thing that people you know don't do properly in restaurants sometimes, they just sort of go, ah, you know, not my problem. Yeah, we have to begin wrapping, but I just want to, it's, it, I think what's so important is that it's very threatening to people when there is a cycle, when someone uh, threatens to break the cycle, what it reveals is how arbitrary those practices were and how completely irrelevant they were to the actual experience the, you know, diner or whatever had of the place and all of a sudden it's just being dickish, it's not actually creating camaraderie or a team spirit or anything, and it seems to me that's, if I had to put my finger on it, that's- To put it a smarter way, yeah. <laughs> no, but that's, that's, principally, that's principally your contribution in your double hat wearing capacity as both an outspoken feminist and a restaurant tricks, which is that you can create great re restaurants without any of that uh, culture, and I can see why that would be- You can, and you know, sometimes I wonder if the business suffers because of it. I mean, luckily we're very busy, but I'm sure lots of people don't come to my restaurants because of who they think I am. I would love to know what the net net on that is. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a win, to be honest. <laughs> I'm like, you don't have to come. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, your your restaurants include the Black Hoof, Grey Gardens, which is new here and looks like a jewel. I can't wait to go. Uh, cocktail bar. Uh, rum bar, uh, uh, all of them are with Roland, correct? But rum bar has... has uh, rum corner and Agricole are like especially... Uh, rum corner, I'm sorry. Like yeah. a sharing relationship restaurant thing. He's not a restaurateur, he's an artist. He's an artist. And yeah. I want to say quickly, both of those restaurants, Agricole in Montreal and rum, bar, rum corner here, are built around murals by Roland that are extraordinary works of pub public art. They really and are. And they make the space uh, cohere in addition to all the other touches Aww. from you know, Jenna. Anyway, thank there? you so much for coming <laughs> on the show. Thank so you guys, fun. that was so fun. Thank you. All right, well, uh, we made it through the shitstorm alive, almost. 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 We'll All right, see. hold on. Here comes, the, <laughs> here comes the eye of the storm, eye of the shitstorm. All right, well, now is the moment in our podcast where we endorse Dane. No, what do you have? <laughs> Extra long wind up in honor of a live show. Very long wind up to the last syllable <laughs> there. I can go name. much longer. Uh, okay, so I, as as usual, when we come to a, a 
another place, another city, especially a foreign country, I like to endorse something that has something to do with that country. But then the question becomes, how can I endorse something that every single person doesn't already know and just not be bringing coals to Newcastle kind of thing? And so I hope that not everyone in Canada knows about this. But even if y'all do, the whole world doesn't, and, and they should. So this kind of brings together my own personal love and my current project with, um, with learning about Canada. So in 1964, um, Buster Keaton, who I'm writing a book on right now and who's sort of one of my heroes, was 69 years old and, uh, and he was only a year and a half or so away from, the, from early 1966 when he would die. And he made his last film in Canada. It was with the, uh, the National Film Board of Canada and it was a 24 minute short. Does anyone out there know this, this movie? Yeah? Um, and it's called The Rail Rotter and it's essentially a silent short. This, in a way, would almost count as his, his last film that he in some way created. He was not the director. He co-directed it with someone else, but he was the one who chose to make it a silent movie to fill it with the kind of gags that he used to do in his own silent movies. And in The Rail Rotter, the idea is that there's sort of a touristic promotion of Canada, and he gets in an old-fashioned rail car, one of those hand cars, you know? And uh, it begins in Halifax, it ends in, I believe, Vancouver, and he just crosses the entire nation, the entire top of the continent, uh, getting into various scrapes, some of which recall some gags from his silent films, some of which play on the landscape around him. And, uh, and it's, it's a really beautiful, funny, and strange kind of movie to see him all of those years later, 50 years later or so, um, back in the world of thinking up silent gags. So part of my endorsement is to watch The Rail Router, which you can watch on the National Film Board of Canada website, and we'll link to it on our show page. And there's also, I don't know if people who know The Rail Router know this, but there's a one hour long documentary about the making of this short called Buster Keaton Rides Again that you can also find online, and we'll link to that. And that's really, really wonderful just as a, it's a sound film, and it, it's just wonderful as a document of his life. So you see he and his wife kind of camping out on the road as they're making this movie. They're taking a regular rail car you know, alongside and then shooting during the day in this, this little hand car thing. And you get to see him just hanging out, smoking cigarettes, telling jokes, playing the ukulele and singing old vaudeville songs. And uh, it's just a really wonderful portrait of Buster Keaton late in his life. So um, Buster Keaton Rides Again and The Rail Rotter together. Those are my, my endorsement for Canada. That's fantastic. <laughs> Julia Turner, what have you got? Uh, well, like Dana, I like to recommend something from our host country. And unlike Dana, I have no, uh, no illusions that you guys won't already know this. But um, since, as expressed, Joni Mitchell, though revered, is, is too frighteningly uh, close to the bone to me, for me, um, my most sentimentally felt about Canadian song is the song Scott Pilgrim by the band Plum Tree. Not from Toronto, but from Canada. Only a smattering of applause. Either you don't like the song or you don't know it. I don't know. Um, but I, my husband and I played the song in our wedding. It was our recessional. We uh, walked out to the lyrics, I've liked you for the longest time. And it is a great, a great song of this great nation. So thank you all for that. All right. Well, continuing with the theme, the Canadian band All Vays. <laughs> Otherwise pronounced as always, but uh, I thought I'd add a little cheek. They have a new record out. Uh, they formed in Toronto, as you seem to know, in 2011. Uh, and the new record is Sue Fucking Perb, as I wrote here earlier this evening. It's called <laughs> Anti-Socialites. I don't know if you've heard it yet. It's really freaking good. And what's amazing is the debut record was so good. You were like, these guys are freaking awesome. Like, what a great, you know, reverby, nostalgia-laden, jangle rock outfit. They, they popped fully formed onto the scene. And they have made a better record, which I really didn't think was possible. I mean, no slight on the first one, but the, everything about it, from the writing to the production to the singing, everything has just gone up a notch. It is a terrific rock and roll record, and it's Canadian. Um, and then uh, I would like to say that there are a, a, a very few uh, human beings who carry in their person, in their bearing, the tradition of the Enlightenment. And one of them is the Canadian philosopher, Charles Taylor. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. We so have much an audience who gives I mean, a round of applause for philosophers. I, I love that so we much. We should give live shows at libraries all the time. <laughs> it's so awesome. Uh, best known for what? The book on Hegel, The Sources of the Self. The, uh, he wrote an essay called The Politics of Recognition, though I may not be getting the title quite right. It seems to me as though 
uh, even more rare than the person who carries the enlightenment in his in his day to day being is the person who somehow managed to then take it and imbue the world with it in some uh, uh, you know a measurably positive way. And Taylor strikes me as one of those people. And um, anyway, so find yourself some Charles Taylor to read. He wrote a lot of what he wrote or essay in essay form. Uh, important things that he wrote were in essay form. You don't like the source of the self is a plinth, but you don't have to um, you don't have to start there. But uh, you'd be rewarded even if you did. Thanks, Dana. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. And thank you, Toronto. We had a fucking awesome time. <laughs> All right, I, I almost always forget to include the show's credits during in my live show script, and I did again, but I wrote them out. But a combination of my tortured scrawl and my, um, my decreasing eyesight, I'll see if I can do it. But if I can't, you can chime in. Um, all right, you'll find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page at slate.com slash culturefest, or you can email us at culturefest at slate.com or post on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash culturefest. Do any of these words ring a bell? <laughs> <laughs> our producer is Benjamin Frisch. Our intern is Daniel Schrader. Uh, is, uh, is, that is his name, Daniel Schrader. Andy Bowers is the chief content officer of Panoply Network. You can find our show, entire roster of like-minded and unlike-minded shows at panoply.fm. I would be completely remiss if I didn't give huge thanks to Gregory McCormick and the Toronto uh, public Library and um, uh, Reference Library for hosting us tonight, and many thanks to Slate Events uh, uh, guru, wonderful Kirsten Holtz, and also to Natalie Kurtz here at the library who made everything very Thank smooth. We had Thanks, a guys. fucking awesome time. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>